Hello everyone, it's Glenn. I wanted to, I wanted to do a video on what I think is the actual history or of South Australia, what I think it actually is. Starting from this image from 1492 by Andrea Mantegna, if that's his name, Mantegna, Madonna's Madonna della Vittoria painted in 1492, and what's really is a beautiful picture. If you zoom in, lovely detail. Mandala, Sun Mandala at the back. And what do you see in the background? A sulfur crested cockatoo. It's not just uh, in this image that there's a sulfur crested cockatoo. In other images going back to the 13th century, we have the sulfur crested cockatoo being presented by the Sultan of Babylon, uh, which is to, to a European monarch. Now, how, who is the Sultan of Babylon? That remains a mystery. There is conjecture and in itself brings me to wonder if there's a Middle Eastern connection to the discovery of Australia. I think it's common sense that there is a connection. We see the trade routes of the old medieval Silk Road in red is a traditional one we all know across the land. And of course, the Arabian powers uh, had a huge kingdoms uh, throughout the Middle Ages that spanned uh, throughout all of Asia. We know there were sultanates being formed in the 1300s or even the late 1200s in Java and who and the sultanates uh, were Islamic and I suspect that they would have had access to Australia as well. Thereby linking up the concept that there is a connection between Middle Eastern people, hence the Sultan of Babylon concept sending, uh, who still remains mysterious, sending something, something to the Western monarchs and having animals from Australia. So does that mean that Middle East settled Australia? Well, it's hard to tell, there's not too much evidence, but there is some. So I want to go through many things about, and I think South Australia is the key settlement point and one of the entrenched settlement points of pre-British uh, foreigners. The area of South Australia that I'm going to cover, this is Google Maps, is around the Adelaide, Port Lincoln, Kangaroo Island, York Peninsula as well. I think there's a huge amount of history here that's been concealed. And we're going to focus on that. The Here is a map which I believe is dated to at 1817 of New Holland. Note that it's called New Holland, therefore it's New Holland. If the British had taken it and was discovering it, I doubt they'd care about keeping the name New Holland. Anyway, moving on. Port Lincoln is mentioned here. What that means, not Adelaide, Port Lincoln and York Peninsula. What does that mean? It means that when they do maps, when they make maps, the maps describe what's actually there. They don't just say it's going to be a port. It is a port. They also History does state officially that there was French whalers there, and they don't say how many, but if you could just think about a whaling ship with you know, 10 to 20 people on it and multiply that by, say, five ships or six ships or even 10 ships, you'd have a, a crew of, say, 200 whalers making uh, whale oil, which was in high demand. In, and according to history, there was already French whalers uh, being settled in Port Lincoln in around the, uh, up to the 1820s. So I suspect that they've been there for a while. And if you have, say, one to 200 whalers being conservative, you can imagine that all the other people associated, all the support people, the families and that kind of thing would then mean that you'd have a settlement no less than 500 people thereby constituting a, a port where you would be producing enough wire oil to sell to through into Europe and Asia. And therefore, they were the ones that first settled in South Australia, let alone other evidence that I'll go through in this video. So important to note, 1817. You also see in 1817, there's Port Phillip and all the other ports are there and they'd all be pre-British, I would imagine. 
Now let's focus on an area around Wallaroo on the York Peninsula called Moonta. Moonta was a, is an old colonial mining area, but I suspect it's been mined for much longer than the last 170 years. I'd say it'd be a lot older than that. So I did a trip down that way, as well as through Adelaide some months back, taking photos, historic photos. One of the classic things about here we have it in Wallaroo, and there's uh, there's uh, fellow, fellow mud flooders there in the foreground. Uh, here is a Cornish uh, smokestack, uh, mining smokestack chimney, and it's from 1861, as it's uh, and it's got there on the side. You might be able to see it, 1861. Okay, so I believe that this is 1861, but I think that the mining in the area is a lot older. Uh, I did quite an extensive number of images. This is in Munta nearby in Wallaroo, and this is where they were, you're processing, I think, copper. This is the inside of the processing plant building, whatever you call it. Uh, and this is from a distance on top of the hill where they did where they brought all the tailings and they just stack it up in a heap in, in, in a grid-like format. Very much what I would think is they did with all the pyramids around the world, with geopolymer and polygon pyramids, they basically did mining, took the tailings, they were all moistened tailings, whatever, from all the sluice mining and crushed rock and they took it all out there and dumped it and they, it would eventually turn into geopolymer cement and harden and become a rock. This is probably how the pyramids and many of the polygonal structures, they're basically the, the repurposing of slurry and tailings and turning that into structures. And this Munta is a sort of an example of a very slack way of that happening. Um, this is done in grid format where they create a sort of a square section and throw the tailings in it. It's important to know that because this, we know how this was done. This is the uh, mining of around Munta. Uh, you've got uh, 700 meters deep of mining shafts. It would have taken a long time to do this. And it's just worth noting that they could have been doing this much longer than what they say. Not sure, but I do think the area has been mined for a long time. From here, I wanna talk a bit about Port Adelaide, which I think is, and Adelaide too. Uh, Port Adelaide, looks uh, the architecture looks very medieval almost but i could be wrong all right this is a typical building in port adelaide it looks pretty much medieval but it doesn't have to be it has these strange corners where the you have where the stone is different now and sometimes different colors and they're set in a tooth mark arrangement this is called coin corners or coin architecture this is typically edwardian I'd imagine it looks rough and medieval because of the nature of the stones in the area. I don't think it is medieval, but who knows? Uh, it, this is all through the Port Adelaide area. You have the sunken windows and the raised streets like you would in mud flood, that sort of thing. These buildings look particularly ancient, I must say. They don't look 19th century to me, but they could be, but I think they're probably more 18th century before the British is my guess, because this is a 19th century building that we see around Australia in, in standard uh, Federation style. This is what you typically see in a new settlement in Australia. Um, Port Adelaide it had uh, quite a few uh, powers, uh, maritime powers. We have different flags that needs investigating work out what were the maritime powers in the region. There's an interesting flag there that might not mean anything. But going back to the University of Adelaide in North Terrace now, this is an interesting thing. North Terrace, uh, Adelaide. The structures there seem quite old with the coin uh, corners as well. Uh, this is quite unique and different to some of the other older buildings in the center of town that have a sort of Germanic feel about it, a Prussian feel about it. These ones do not feel that way. They feel like the classic Edwardian. So you have a very stark variation. This to me seems older than British, even if it's just maybe 50 years older as a guess, but I could be wrong. 
this is in Adelaide. This uh, relief I found on the over the doorway of the uh, I think it's either the courthouse or the council chambers or something I think it's council chambers. It's one of the main government, old government buildings, and you can see that this is your standard leaf work where you, you, know, you have your vines, which is part of the occult tradition, I suspect. The green man in the middle with two nasty teeth and a dragon on each side. So I thought that that was a rather and, and a fork tongue, of course, um, double. It's yeah, I guess so. So it looks pretty creepy, and they put that out of a government building for some reason. There you go. Speaking about architects, um, here is old uh, old Adelaide Jail. This is the Tower of Old Adelaide Jail. Uh, it was uh, Governor Hindmarsh, someone worth researching seriously if you want to go into any of the original people responsible for raising history. I would be curious to see. Uh, information on Hindmarsh and a few other families worth mentioning. So th this, these buildings, this is a Wikipedia, this, these buildings were done by George Strickland Kingston, who was a land surveyor, I believe, um, ended up becoming, uh, ended up becoming an architect. Uh, did all sorts of amazing things. Let's just click from very quickly to see how incredible the architecture was. Here is one of them. You just go through. Here's a, here's a government house. His, his architectural genre is very, very diverse. Here's another one, Cummins House. He also did the original Treasury Building. So very active, though not an architect originally. I'm pretty certain he was a land surveyor. Then he turned to architect and he did some of the most complicated stuff. So that kind of seems a bit dubious, but it does give you a, an initial date stamping. Is that he was building these buildings in, let's just do, I'll go Adelaide Jail, because that will give you a timing. Uh, so, however, in late 1840, after construction began, plans were altered by Governor George Gore. Okay, all right, so we got around the date of 1840. It's important to start date stamping when you get these strange things, such as an architect that's a land surveyor suddenly doing all these things. 1840, now what else can you link up to 1840 in Adelaide? All right, so what I do is I look for the oldest newspapers. Once the newspapers start printing, I know that the history is pretty much starting where you cannot really say it's fake after that, even though the newspapers embellish, they don't lie. This is what I assume. So 1836, the paper started in England, and then 1837 went to Adelaide. So 1837 is where, and I was printing enough to make it worth doing, therefore there was a population operating in 1837. So that is the time where the Adelaide region had already been invaded, repurposed and reworked and that's your point where you can't dispute history really after that it's only before that where you'll get major changes and disputes so that's 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 how you can start sort of di dissecting reality like is if a building is from 1850 what well, probably is from 1850 you know so if it's if it looks older then okay it could be much older because I suspect that the way the British did is that they would invade, they would send militia in, invade the site, wipe it out, and then spend 10 years or so slowly recovering it, and then eventually the settlers would come once everything was cleaned up. All right, now, how can you tie it all together? We have to go and look at the indigenous people. But if you look at the indigenous people, and I think that's a good clue about how we start tying things together. So the Narangeri Nation uh, are the uh, tr uh, traditional custodians of the Lower Murray area, uh, and they they had, were quite an influential indigenous group. Uh, they have their own language, of course, and one of the words, funny enough, for river is Murundi. 
which sounds like Murray, and Murray River may have come from this word, though they think it comes from somewhere else. So the, the, one of the interesting features about the, this culture is that they practice circumcision, which is, a, it, which is classically an Islamic or Hebraic uh, tradition. It's interesting that they've chosen that, particularly when I'm starting to associate some of the loan words and some of the aspects of South Australia with the Middle East and with England as well. So another important indigenous group is the Ghana people, and it, but it's spelled K-A-U-R-N-A. But it's spelled, it's spelled um, with a K, but it's actually pronounced Ghana. Very much like the, it's quite confusing because you have the Ghan, the actual railway express named after the Afghan or Ghana, Ghana Camelliers. So there could actually be a conflation where you have indigenous people being named after Camelliers that were here prior to the British. That's just a hypothesis. Uh, I want to pick a word that I think could be a cognate of Middle Eastern languages, and that is Tan Tanya, which is here, meaning red kangaroo place. But what I do is I, refer, I usually look at uh, consonants together and I actually break them up. And this is how I, I've done this, explain this in other videos. So I would call this Tarantania. So Taran is like Taran Point in Sydney. Taran is, is like Tehran in Iran. Tehran, Taran. This is a word that keeps coming up over and over again. Um, I've been trying to connect much of the um, research with the Pashtun speaking peoples where I think the Kamalis came from uh, amongst other areas and the Pashto speaking people in Pakistan, um, the language is, a, is similar to Urdu. If you look at Taran and where the word Taran comes from, in the various Persian languages, it has, it, it, what I like about the word Taran is that uh, I can see it as being a place of paradise, a deliverance, an end result, um, a crossing, a being saved, deliverance. Um, this is what I like about it being, because Tehran, people think it, it, there's different, uh, no one really knows where the word Tehran, the, the capital of Iran, um, no one really knows exactly the etymology of that of the word very well. There's, but I think what we're doing is, is Taran just means deliverance. I think it's the best name for it. And it makes sense because when you think about Tarantania in Adelaide, it's a, it's a beautiful area at the end of the world after uh, uh, escaping from all the invasions all around Asia and Europe. It'll be a place of sanctuary. Tanya, on the other hand, is, 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 is another um, Middle Eastern word and it's a common name for many languages and it means a princess or a, a queen or a noble woman. So, ta so it's basically the, the, the resting, uh, the, the place of sanctuary of the of, of, a, of a noble lady. So you can sort of see the connection between, between that and the word Adelaide. So Adelaide comes in as a German word for a, relating to a queen. And you could probably look at the origin of the word Adelaide and see some connection to how that kind of is used to overlay Tarantania, which probably means a similar thing. Though now, according to the indigenous language, it just means the place of the red kangaroo. So, I'm just playing with those ideas for the moment. There are other potential words we can look at. But for now, we'll just stick with that. We need to now talk about the Australian feral camel. These camels do come essentially from that area of Pakistan or Afghanistan, or the Camelies did anyway. Um, the story is, is that they turned up with one sorry, sorry ass camel in 18 something or other, 1830 something, and they all died as one left. And, and out of these saw a few handful of sorry camels, uh, one guy rode it and the camel bounced and he shot himself. His name's Horrocks. He ended up dying from a bad behaving camel and he ordered the camel to be shot. And what I find interesting about all this is that there was people even bothering using camels and having cameliers all through the place and and the proper importing of afghan camels didn't start till the 1850s so that's the story i find that a bit strange that you would, from the 1850s onwards you'd, you'd you'd have so many camels throughout australia just coming from a handful of camels in the 1850s it's possible it's possible but i find it a bit suspect um 
The Afghan Camelies were um, Afghan or Ghan or Ghana Camelies, that's their name. So I suspect that I suspect that they were there before the British and the British started to ta take over the camel trade routes, but made a stuff up of it because they didn't have the experience. That's my hypothesis, and that then allows me to tie in uh, the idea that, which I'll explain what my conclusions are, but I would say that there were Afghan cameleers before the British, probably brought there by English traders that were not British East India Company. And these English or French traders or French traders that traded with whalers or whatever would have brought in that architecture that I talked about, just to remind you, classic art coin architecture at Edwardian, which you probably would have seen anywhere in the 18th century, in the 1700s in Breton, Western France, and all through England and possibly Wales and elsewhere. Uh, I think that this would have been common architecture. And so therefore I suspect that there was English traders coming in, managing the camel trade routes, probably in the 1700s, early 1800s, before being wiped out and having their routes taken over by the British, who then subsequently stuffed it up and couldn't make a go of it till it took them 20 years to figure out how to do it because they were British and therefore they were hopeless. So that's my theory on that. And that would also explain why the Ghana people, the indigenous people of the Adelaide area, had to have their tribe name misspelt with K so that we wouldn't get the connection that that there was an influence between some original Pashto speaking Afghan people coming in and, and influencing the local cultures to some degree or being assimilated by the local indigenous, which is probably likely. This is a this is a Norman church in Riverton, north of Adelaide in South Australia. What is it doing there? Now, what now? It, look, it could have. It, it was apparently it was built in 1850 something. I'm not saying it wasn't. It could have been rebuilt in 1850 something. But why would all these people decide to build a medieval church when no one else was building medieval churches? But this is a med. This is literally a medieval church built in the middle of like towards the Barossa, not quite there, but. It's a beautiful church, it's Norman, has a lovely internal staircase. What's it doing? Um, I don't think Normans were in Adelaide in the in the 11th, 12th century, but I do think that people were there probably building uh, uh, out of posterity, maybe in the 15th, 1600s or 1700s. And then in the 1850s, they saw this old wreck and decided to rebuild it. Quite likely that's the reason. I just sort of mentioned that. It's, I've always been fascinated by this small church and found it as an out of place artifact. In conclusion, I think that the Port Lincoln and Adelaide and Port Adelaide and all the areas in general were settled by, by Western European peoples to some degree, as well as bringing over uh, Middle Eastern peoples uh, and I think I don't know who was really in charge first or who came first and so forth but there's not much material evidence of of a Afghanistan or Afghani people making temples and so on before the British but the evidence of them is there and the evidence of, of English French Gaelic peoples are there too before the British I, through my research, I know that uh, there are people who who swear or who state that there were foreigners, non-British foreigners, arriving prior to British settlement and assimilating in the local populations, and their history has been wiped out. This has been generally understood, but people are too scared to come out. So this is a safe bet that South Australia was settled before the British. Uh, truly settled before the British, not just a few uh, buccaneers and leftover people in a few shacks, but something more substantial. I've looked at other aspects to South Australia, including uh, the origin of Barossa Valley, potentially being 
not particularly Germanic, but perhaps Prussian. I'm still yet to get into the detail. In, but I know for certain that this place has been settled before the British and it was firmly settled. So thanks very much. i uh, love to hear your comments. I also would like you to come out and state uh, if you want to come on the record, if you are from South Australia and do have family history, either through the Indigenous or through colonial uh, lines, uh, if you do have a story about pre-British uh, interaction with foreigners, I'd love to hear about it. We can probably do a, a an interview or you can come on the record or you can come on the record anonymously. That would be great and we can take this subject further. So another thing I probably should mention is about shipwreck records as well, but I not, probably can't do it in this video right now because it's, there's a lot of gaps uh, I wanted to cover off on that uh, and how it's hard to get data. And there are a lot of other mysterious things about Adelaide, such as the tunnels. So there are quite a few interesting things, but that's probably it for now. Thanks very much.